Hello and welcome to Comic Island. My name is Arden, and today we're talking about the very best and worst of comics in 2017. So, as I start to shake off the holidays, not that I find them overly stressful, just very busy, I am finding myself a little short on time in terms of being able to get you guys some content. To that end, I've decided to make this little video going over my favorite and least favorite things of 2017 in the larger world of comics. So this is going to be a very loose and unscripted video as I go over my thoughts and feelings concerning the year. It's been a pretty good year overall, there's a lot of really exceptional things that I want to give a shout out to, and some stuff that isn't so exceptional but doesn't really veer into the terrible territory so much as just a whole bunch of stuff I found disappointing or mediocre. It should be noted I've already gone over this a little bit this year in my video going over how the various companies fared this year. In that video, I pretty much declared that DC was the winner of 2017 as a company. And we're going to pretty much start from there. I would agree with that sentiment still. They are the best company overall, with Marvel seeming like the pretty much loser as a publisher. DC really changed the game and amped up their content, bringing out a lot of polished events and very interesting titles, while Marvel lagged behind, suffered a lot of cancellations, and had a lot of events that largely disappointed me. That of course isn't true when it comes to the film industry or the world of television necessarily, although I would give props to DC in both the video games and TV department. But Marvel is still swinging hard and easily the best comic book film studio out there, and let's not split any hairs about that. They are unambiguously so given their performance this year. Nevertheless, there's a lot of other categories and specific comics that I haven't talked about, and we're going to go over them in a series of categories I've sort of came up with. To that end, we're going to begin with the best indie comic, and that choice for me is My Favorite Thing is Monsters. For those of you pursuing various other best and worst of lists on various other comic book websites, you've probably heard of this title. It's shown up on quite a few of those top lists. And I would agree with those writers who have placed this comic on this level. This almost unknown illustrator, Emil Ferris, brought out this comic and it like spent a couple weeks on a ship or something like that before it finally was available for public market, which is the only reason it qualifies for any 2017 best of list. But it's so awesome, full of these cool literary allusions, creepy imagery, and just interesting content. It's fascinating and utterly astounding this is Emile Ferris's first graphic novel, but as the book promises, it won't be her last. And I look forward to seeing future iterations of her content. I definitely recommend it because it's certainly worth your time and was my favorite thing I read this year. As for the worst indie comic, well I don't really like punching down on the indie crowd too much, so I wound up picking Savage Dragon. This title has always been a little bit of a kind of pulpy sort of story that goes for over-the-top nonsense, but this year's iteration of that was particularly over-the-top and nonsensical, and I just can't recommend it for public consumption, to say the least. But let's move on to a more fertile ground with the best writer. And of course, I mostly focused on comic book writers for this category, and I have to say, it really belongs to Tom King this year. With phenomenal work in the world of Batman, and a really interesting series in the form of Mr. Miracle, Tom King has done some really great writing for DC this year. And I have to say, out of everyone, he impressed me the most. Between his work on The Button, to the stuff he did with Bruce and Selina, He's a really good writer, and he's really showing his chops through the work on Mr. Miracle, which nearly won another category we're about to get to in this video. Even his story in DC's holiday special this year was my favorite, and yeah, props to Tom King. He was my favorite writer this year. As for the worst, well, I thought a lot about this because there were quite a few nominees to say the least, but I chose not to pick Nick Spencer and instead went with Howard Chaikin. A writer who's done some stuff I like and has done a lot of mediocre stuff in various comic book titles and on the Flash TV show, but this year, this year he wrote The Divided States of Hysteria, which is a really weird, misplaced comic. 
Like, when I read it, I can kind of see where he's coming from, but it just feels like he's the least qualified person to be talking about the stuff this comic dwells on. To be honest, that wouldn't be enough to put him on this list. What really drove me over the edge into putting him on here is the way he responded to critics of this content. Basically turning on them and losing his mind over it and just behaving entirely unprofessionally for a writer. I'm a little uneasy about that because I don't want to necessarily say that a good writer has to respond well to criticism or even has to agree with criticism. But the way he handled himself, the way he presented his opposition to critics just showed that he really only wanted to be heard and didn't want to have a discussion about the sensitive issues that this comic was bringing up. And if you're going to do that, then you don't deserve to be a writer. If you only want to be heard, and if you only want your voice to drive the discussion of a sensitive issue, then you can't be a writer. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, you have to listen and respond to people, especially for an issue that you don't come from. Howard Traken didn't grow up in the Middle East, so for him to start a dialogue about this, he needs to be able to listen to other people and respond. That's my big issue, is that he outright refused to do this and threw a big tantrum over people criticizing his work. And you know what? If you're going to be a baby, you're going to be the worst baby. Enjoy the accolade, Howard Chaikin, because I don't think I'm going to be buying comics that you write anymore. Hmm. So there. <laughs> so, best artist. Uh, I actually gave this to two people who are unrelated to each other, but both really presented themselves well this year to me, and I couldn't pick one over the other. The first person is Steve McNiven. Say what you will about Secret Empire, but this man's art during that event was gorgeous and unforgettable. I really didn't like that event. We'll talk more about that in a second. But boy did I like his art, and he's always been just this phenomenal artist that has this really impactful work when it comes to his drawings of superheroes. It's difficult to describe it, it just feels so present and expressive when he draws these characters in a way that blows my mind. It's a real shame that I didn't like Secret Empire because he did such good work in it that it's disappointing to say the least. The guy also did some really great work with Monsters Unleashed and I just had to give him a shout out here. The other artist I'm going to give the best of is the one who probably deserves it a little more, but I just couldn't let Steve get uh, no notice whatsoever. And that would be David Rubin, whose work on stuff like Aether, Beowulf, and Rumble was just amazing. He really has a memorable style to him, and he showed up on a lot of other best ofs this year, and I really understand why. The guy totally deserves it, and easily is one of the best artists in the market right now. As for the worst artist, I actually really had trouble with this category. There's very few artists out there who I'd qualify as bad. They just don't have a style that speaks to me. The bad artists tend not to get a lot of work after all, and it's hard to pick on art because it's such an inherently subjective feel. Then, oh blessed then, I remembered that one artist really stood out as the most terrible person and easily deserves this award. So a big thank you to Artie and Saya for making my job a lot easier by starting off his run on X-Men Gold with uh, adoptive Jew Mark Guggenheim by inserting a series of anti-Semitic and, and, I don't know, weird Arabic dog-whistling imagery in his first issue of X-Men Gold. Thankfully, he was caught, fired by Marvel, and is unlikely to find mainstream work ever again. Good. Moving on to the next topic is Best New Series. Black Bolt is my choice for this. For a while I had considered a popular choice for this category, Mr. Miracle, although I really had to side with Black Bolt. There's nothing wrong with Mr. Miracle, I just found I kind of lost interest in it as that series progressed. But Black Bolt, a phenomenal new series by Saladin Ahmed, is amazing really reminds me of how fun this character can be in the right hands and with the right proper amount of attention to him. And overall is my favorite new series that came out this year. It's definitely worth your time and a solid example of the kind of awesome work Marvel can do if it really wants to and invests in new talent like this. As for the worst new series, well that title also goes to a Marvel comic. That would be Venom. 
<sighs> Look, I don't have much of a theoretical issue with Marvel getting rid of the whole Flash Thompson plot development with the Venom symbiote. But if you're going to throw out all that character development and awesome work by Recommender, you at least have to have some direction or new ideas for Venom in the first place. Sadly, this new series by Greg Costa, I think, I don't even care anymore, really didn't present any new ideas and basically just tread ground already covered before. Venom returns back to form and is pretty much just back to normal, while... We get stupid things like Venomverse and Venom Inc, which suggest a profound lack of originality on the part of the writers and the company in terms of what they want to do with this character. It was easily the most deeply disappointing series I found this year because it never really went anywhere or did anything, and I find that frustrating. Especially the host that sort of bridges Flash Thompson to Eddie Brock. He was completely useless. What was his name again? Lee Price or something like that? I, I'm literally going off of memory here and refused to look it up out of principle, so whatever. That guy was boring and stale and just a... Uh... <sighs> Venom sucked. Let's move on to the next category, and that would be Best Miniseries. For that, I'm going to give it to DC Metal. While not necessarily perfect, and, and I gotta be clear, I was really tempted to give this to the Batman Elmer Fudd crossover, DC Metal really surprised me. I had high expectations for Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo's big crossover event. I didn't have expectations this high. I did not expect it to be this good. I didn't expect the Dark Knights to be this original or interesting, and I am very glad they're going to continue existing beyond this event because it's awesome and it gives this particular story a lot of weight and distinction to it because it introduces these characters, all of whom are very interesting and have these cool backstories to them. Scott Snyder is a goddamn genius for farming out those stories to all the various writers in DC and letting them fill in the blanks. At such a level of trust, and it worked and paid off so well for him that, you know, he just needs to pat himself on the back. This is one of the best events in the modern age to ever come out in either of DC or Marvel, and it's just so good. Doomsday Clock has also been pretty great so far, but it's only in its early stages, so I'm just going to give it a shout out here. And meanwhile, Justice League vs. Suicide Squad wasn't anything all that special, but I had a lot of fun with it. It was a polished event overall. So between that and the various crossovers that DC did between their DC characters and the Hanna-Barbera comics they've been doing, they had a solid year of miniseries. All of them were good, and all of them contended for the winner of Best Miniseries. Yet it's DC Metal that wins to me. It's the one that most impressed me, it's the one I most enjoyed, and overall I think it offers the most. As for the worst miniseries, well, my friends, I, uh, it's Secret Empire. Now look, this isn't terrible, this isn't hot garbage, but given what it set out to do and what it wanted to be and what it actually was, Secret Empire gets the worst miniseries. It didn't quite live up to the high expectations I had for an interesting political take on an evil Captain America taking over the country. It kind of just stalled and then eventually resolved events as quickly as possible, pretty much like every major Marvel event over the last couple of years. And that's very boring, and with it being filled with tie-ins out the wazoo, too much content and clutter going on at once, and nothing really meaty to offer to its readers, Secret Empire is easily the most disappointing thing out there. When we compare it to DC Metal, which carefully only published a few issues at most of the event at any given week, which trusted its own talent to carry a lot of this story instead of putting all the focus on the main series and had a strong sense of direction and purpose to it, Secret Empire is a complete mess and just sucks all the life out of the room. It was really disappointing, although it should be mentioned that it wasn't outright bad. There weren't any truly terrible miniseries, Secret Empire is just the closest thing to that. It was the worst that came out. It reminds me Marvel really needs to revamp how they publish comics, because they're all over this worst of list. They do have features on the best of side as well, but they really need to look at how they 
produce content in their comic book publishing line. Because god damn it, it is disappointing when you line all this stuff up. Now, let's move on outside of the world of comics to the best TV show. There are a lot of solid television shows that adapt comic books out there these days, and it's enough that it's a real competitive field for them. In the end, though, the best one for me was easily Legion, a show I really didn't think much of or expect much out of to begin with, but did nothing but impress me for its entire first season. This is a show that's so well put together, it's amazing this was produced on cable television. I mean, cable TV has really amped up its game over the last decade or so, but even then, they haven't ever produced something like this before. With the showrunner behind Fargo running the show here, it really works well, and he tells something distinct from Fargo, but kind of evokes a lot of the stuff I like about that show, particularly its second season blends it into this really interesting comic book story. There's no costumes or a lot of the other superhero tropes we've come to expect out of TV shows and film in here, but instead there's a lot of really interesting content, and the villain is so cool, and I'm so glad to have seen a proper rendition of that character in another medium outside of the comic books. I don't want to give anything else away because it's really good, and if you haven't seen this show, I recommend you check out the first season. It's only 10 episodes long, and you'll find out pretty quickly if you're going to like it or not. For me, I loved it. It was my favorite thing that came out in the world of television and comic books this year. There's a lot of good stuff out there. I really like Supergirl, The Flash, I even like Gotham. But none of those shows compare whatsoever to Legion, which I'd easily put out there with the best television shows on the market right now. Period. Regardless of whether or not they're comic book adaptations. But before we get into the worst, I will give a shout out to The Punisher, which was really good and everything it needed to be to be a Punisher show. But at the end of the day, I knew what to expect out of The Punisher. I did not expect what I got out of Legion. I also want to give a shout out to iZombie. This is a really fun show based on the DC comic that I discovered this year. The show consistently remembers that it is there to have fun over anything else. The two Walking Dead shows, which to be honest were solid nominees for the worst comic book television shows this year, could learn a lot from iZombie and the way it has fun with its own premise. Now as for the worst, well, that also was a pretty easy choice in spite of there being some competition on the worst side as well. While Arrow is a mess, and I don't know anyone who still watches Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this dubious distinction has to go to the Inhumans. God damn, after all the stuff Marvel put us through and trying to push the Inhumans and make them a thing and trying to make it into a film franchise, we ended up getting this lousy, half-baked, under-budget TV show. Where Legion worked with its lower budget and showed some really phenomenal and crazy imagery in spite of that, Inhumans looks cheap, feels cheap, doesn't live up to the source material, which can be good, and instead just disappoints turn after turn. Having Lord Ramsey play uh, Max was a great decision, but did not pay off whatsoever. While I thought it was really cool having Black Bolt, and the show did some great stuff depicting a mute character as one of their main figures in their story. But in spite of that, The Inhumans is basically a story about these kings being overthrown, and it's hard to root for the protagonists of the story let alone enjoy all the lousy writing and poor effects that litter the entire series. Thankfully, I don't think we'll be seeing any more of this show, which is a blessing because it sucks so bad. The shame of it all, though, is it puts Marvel in a weird position if they ever want to have a cool crossover, say, between the Fantastic Four and the Inhumans now. And it probably will never happen thanks to this show. So, my dislike of it runs pretty deep overall. It essentially ruins all these characters for the MCU, unless they choose to just ignore it going forward, which, to be honest, I'd be perfectly fine with. If they have to recast a bunch of people and just throw out a lot of the events in this TV series, all for the better, because it's awful. Let's move on. So, with that covered, let's go to another medium, that of video games. This year offered a lot of potential entries into the best video game, and I considered quite a few different titles. I thought about Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite, which in spite of not including any X-Men or Fantastic Four characters, 
which given the history of this series I found particularly insulting, did present a fighting game that was a lot of fun to play, changed up the Marvel vs. Capcom formula in a very positive way, and uh, quite an interesting one at that, and offered enough that it was a good game overall. I wish they had spent less time creating this overly long, complicated story campaign and focusing more on making a more diverse roster of characters, but nevertheless it was an enjoyable entry. I just can't look past the various flaws and the insulting choice of characters without a little bit of disdain, so it wasn't my choice for the best. I also considered the various Telltale games that came out this year, with two solid Batman titles and a Guardians of the Galaxy game I quite enjoyed. These games are good, but pretty much limited to Telltale storytelling, which in particular with Guardians of the Galaxy I found limited and quite predictable at this point. Telltale is getting into this pattern where you can kind of see where they're going with every decision that you're given, and it's starting to wear on me. I didn't really get into the story as much as I feel Guardians of the Galaxy wanted me to, which is a shame because I love that game's score and soundtrack. But to me, the best game this year has to be Injustice 2, which in spite of being riddled with microtransactions and having some questionable choices here and there, and being a murderous nightmare for new players, I love this game. It's a lot of fun. They use the whole armor thing to really give this game a lot of depth, and it's one of the best fighting games in terms of giving you stuff to do once you've played through the story, and that really works. The whole multiverse thing is surprisingly fun once you get into it, and overall I quite enjoyed Injustice 2. But I've enjoyed the DLC characters that have come out so far, and they've all been really creative. In fact, the whole roster is this really interesting selection of different characters with different strengths and weaknesses. In spite of what I said about preferring that these games focus a little more on their roster, I quite enjoyed the story we got in Injustice 2, as it presents a very interesting scenario where we're basically given this alternate Earth as presented in the first Injustice game, and see how they deal with encountering a threat in the future. We see how these divisions affect the mindset of characters like Batman and Superman, and inform their behavior throughout the game. I'm also amazed at how much it pays homage and reverence to the Injustice comics that take place before this event. NetherRealm Studios has basically crafted, along with Tom Taylor, this rich and detailed alternate world of DC that's difficult to place or compare to anything else in the world of comic book media because it's just so unique and original, and it's a lot of fun overall. If you haven't played Injustice 2, I do recommend it, though I would suggest you hold out for the ultimate version of the game so you aren't bombarded with the need to buy like 10 DLC characters at once. That is a flaw, and I wish NetherRealm Studios offered a more complete game, but I didn't mind spending the 80 bucks I got the ultimate version for on sale, and all I had to do after that was buy one character through a microtransaction after, and I'm satisfied with that purchase. It's more than the average game, but Injustice 2 offers more than the average game, with excellent graphics, a really fun gameplay, and a lot of cool characters you can play as. As for the worst video game, I'm going to give it to the mobile version of Injustice 2. There's always a roster of terrible Marvel and DC mobile games out there at any given time, riddled with microtransactions and offering very little otherwise. They're all junk, and Injustice 2 on the mobile version is no different. I had to install this piece of crap to unlock Grid on the proper game. It's basically just a few button presses and a lot of those timed unlocks and all the other crap associated with these microtransaction-heavy free-to-play games. But goddamn, is it just one of the worst I've ever seen. Recently, they brought out this offer where you could spend $100 for three characters. Three characters on a mobile game. For reference, I just talked about how I spent 80 bucks for the full game, including 10, get it, 10 DLC characters. Well, sorry, it was like $89 for that. Now, let's be clear, that's $60 for the basic game and $29 for everything else. So, so that's about $4 per character. It's $30 per character for that deal on the Injustice 2 mobile game. That is a ripoff. That is deliberately designing your game to feed on those whales that the game developers talk about. That is predatory. There's no other way to put it. So this is easily the worst game to come out this year. 
with a comic book name on it. Warner Brothers should, although they won't be, ashamed of themselves for having their name associated with this piece of crap. I could even see the argument that Injustice 2's mobile edition doesn't even count as a real game, because it's just a series of t screen pushes and microtransactions. There's no actual gameplay involved. And if that's the case, and you don't feel it qualifies for this category, which, like I said, I could really see that argument, then I will give this to Marvel's Heroes Co Champions game, or whatever they're calling it now which stripped away all of the Fantastic Four characters as part of their new license agreement with Marvel, only for that deal to basically be pointless now that Disney has access to the Fantastic Four characters again. So that was a terrible waste of time, <sighs> and I don't find that game particularly fun. Sorry if you're a fan of that Diablo-style gameplay, I am not. But the real terrible game is Injustice 2 Mobile Edition. It's just a matter of whether or not you count it as a game to begin with. So now let's move on to the world of movies. I actually do want to talk about the actors and actresses that play various characters for a moment. So for the best actor, I really have to give that to Tom Holland. He just did such an amazing job as Spider-Man. He really feels young and just so perfect for the role. And overall, Spider-Man Homecoming was just a fun, brilliant take on the character. And Tom Holland is a huge part of why. As for the worst superhero actor, I'm going to give it to the lower half of Henry Cavill's face in Justice League. Oh man, I don't get this at all. I don't understand why Superman couldn't just have a beard. It would fit given that he was like resurrected and stuff, right? I guess that wouldn't make sense technically, but I don't know, it works for me in a visual perspective. Like, oh, he's different because he's back from the dead. That's why he has a beard now. It would literally have been that simple. But no, instead, because of some contract shenanigan, Warner Brothers couldn't make Henry Cavill shave. So instead, they digitally altered his face to look clean shaven and it looks so weird and out of place sometimes you don't notice it but sometimes it couldn't be more obvious and it's just one of justice league's many problems <laughs> henry cavill's a fine actor i don't have any problems with him and i think he would make a better superman under a better dceu to say the least but it's just so distracting i don't know why they would ever do this ah well let's move on to the best actress and that was a pretty difficult choice for me because there were two solid entries. The first would of course be Gal Gadot, who was an excellent Wonder Woman, but the real winner and the one I'm going to give it to is Daphne Keene as Laura or X-23. I loved Logan. I thought it was moving and sincere and just such a wonderful take on this character and this girl is a huge part of it. She carried the movie in a lot of ways, especially some of the scenes. And once she starts to really get involved in the events of this story, she's a huge part of it. And boy, like she can scream, she can shout, she can kill. I really hope we see more of her. If Fox or Disney now can somehow rearrange the timeline so that she can show up again, it would be the best thing in the world because she's so great and seeing her grow up into a little X-23 would be amazing and I just hope beyond hope we do get to see that one day. As for the worst superhero actress, well there's a few contenders over in TV land but I'm gonna go ahead and give it to Gal Gadot in Justice League. Yes, she was awesome in Wonder Woman. Yeah, she still is an awesome Wonder Woman. But if you're not going to give her anything meaningful to do, then she's going to be a very boring and pointless character. And given she's the best thing in the DCEU right now, that was particularly disappointing. And yes, I am picking on Justice League, but you know what? That movie did not live up to expectations, okay? Like, it wasn't terrible, but this is a movie called Justice League. Huh? <laughs> it's supposed to be better than that. God damn it. Alright, let's move on to the animated world, and... This one was a pretty easy choice for the best animated superhero movie. That, of course, would be Lego Batman. Uh, I really enjoyed this, even after seeing the Lego movie and having pretty high hopes for the Lego Batman movie. This was awesome, and was one of the best Batman movies ever made. Uh, it's known Dark Knight, but it does kind of say a lot about Batman's character. It's fun as hell, even if there are a few corny moments, and on the whole, it's just such a perfect Batman movie. Almost every Batman villain shows up. The Joker's just great. And Zach Galifianakis easily makes for one of the best Jokers there's ever been. But on the whole, it's just such a fun movie. I definitely recommend it if you've passed this one up thinking it's just for kids. I enjoyed the hell out of it. As for the worst animated movie, that's Teen Titans The Judas Contract. 
Look, I enjoy a lot of these animated DC movies they've been making, but lately they've been more and more disappointing. I didn't enjoy the Judas Contract very much, and I have to say given the source material and how awesome that original story was, or even how it was depicted in the older cartoon, the Judas Contract was super disappointing and didn't really go anywhere exceptional. Yes, DC's animated world is still more developed and at least puts out stuff on a more regular basis when compared to Marvel, but this wasn't very entertaining and I couldn't recommend it to anyone. Meanwhile, while Marvel is lagging behind in the world of animation, they might not be forever. Next year we're getting an animated movie with Miles Morales in it, and I gotta tell you, I'm pretty excited for it. Everything I hear about it, everyone involved behind the scenes, has me pumped for this movie, and I have a feeling it's gonna be solid. Maybe even one of the best superhero movies to come out this year. So keep an eye out for that. As for live action movies, well, the best one was actually really hard for me to pick. There's actually five contenders for this category as far as I'm concerned. Wonder Woman, Spider-Man Homecoming, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2, Thor Ragnarok, and Logan. All of which offered a lot and presented stuff that was outside of the typical expectations for a comic book movie. Wonder Woman was great even if it does have its flaws. Guardians of the Galaxy 2 had a strong emotional arc to it, and if you ask me, in a lot of ways surpassed the original. Spider-Man Homecoming was one of the best damn Spider-Man movies I've ever seen, and I was so close to picking it because it's damn near perfect. But in the end, I have to give it to Logan. Logan was not only emotionally moving and deeply balanced, but it's just one of the best comic book movies ever made because it's just such a good movie. It's so great, and if you miss this one, you really have to go see it. Even if you're ambivalent about Fox's take on the X-Men, or Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, this is so good, and such a great close to that character. As for the worst movie, well, given my rants from earlier, you might expect Justice League, and I was gonna pick that for a while, but after talking about it, I really wanted to do something different, so I'm actually gonna go with Ghost in the Shell. After all, Justice League was just mediocre. And that's just disappointing because of the title of the movie and the potential it could have been. Ghost in the Shell is actively a movie I wouldn't recommend for people. It's not very good, Scarlett Johansson doesn't add anything to the movie, and it really doesn't offer anything the original animated movie or any associated manga offer instead. So that's it for the movies, but I've saved one final category for last. After all, you might have noticed, while I covered the best indie comic and the best new series, I skipped the best comic overall. We're a comic book channel, I wanted to save the most important category when it comes to us for last. So, my favorite comic series of the year that I haven't talked about already is... Silver Surfer. Ah, uh, this was great, it had a wonderful ending and is a wonderful reminder that Dan Slott can write when he's not imprisoned in the terrible trap of modern Spider-Man. It had a wonderful love story and found a way to reconcile the end of the series with the permanent canon of Silver Surfer in a method I found particularly artful. This was a great story, it's sad to see it go, but I quite enjoyed it and am thankful to Dan Slott for making a polished series that I enjoy. See? We can get along! <laughs> <laughs> As for the worst comic, oh, the worst comic I've read that came out this year is America. Now, I actually did review the first issue of this some time ago on our Patreon page. Now, of course, most of you wouldn't have seen that review, so I'll go over my thoughts on that. Uh, basically, I didn't like it, prize of all surprises there, but my reaction was pretty much, oh, well, this really just isn't for me. I got the impression from reading this, this was for more of a Tumblr and meme-friendly crowd than my personal preferences, and that's fine, that's not a big deal at all, so I just didn't recommend it and moved on with my life. I never touched an America comic since then, pretty much, until recently when I started hearing from people how bad it really was. What particularly convinced me that this was an unusually bad comic is the most vocal people that don't like this series are people of Hispanic heritage, and that's very interesting given the nature of this comic. But the writer is someone who a lot of these Hispanic people I've talked to don't feel adequately represents their community. 
and I can't really speak to that myself since I'm not a member of this community. But when I talk to the people who are and how they feel about the issue, it reminds me less of the minstrel shows that they compare it to and more of the Big Bang Theory, where you have these writers who clearly are looking at the world of nerd and fandom from the outside in and are basically using it to make fun of them and start this really popular TV show because of it. America, as I understand it, kind of reads like that, not properly representing the community at hand and instead creating this really annoying storyline for these characters. You can tell I'm sort of hedging my bets on that because I can only speak to my experience reading this comic and my experience is that it's just bad. But I have a feeling what I'm saying is true based on various conversations I've had with you viewers about this comic and how you guys feel about it. I have to say, if I were represented the way Hispanics were in this comic, I would be pretty upset too. So, yeah. <laughs> Marvel has thankfully cancelled this series and I gotta tell you, America just wasn't good. The character herself is actually great. I really like the idea of a superhero that can hop between multiverses pretty much at will. That's amazing. And Stephanie Beatrice of uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine fame seems obsessed with the character and wants to play her in some iteration of the MCU. And all I have to say on that matter is, yes, Marvel, please make this character awesome. Let's get some proper writers behind her and tell a good story. Unfortunately, America, as presented in the comics in her own series, was not very good. And that is disappointing. I've heard a lot of debate from people about whether or not America is actually a good series and if it's worth reading. But I've got to be honest, it's one of the worst comics I've read this year. I don't, taking aside all the politics behind it and all of that nonsense, it's just full of bad heart, bad humor, and lacking a certain heart to it that I think would be great. I've talked to a lot of people from the LGBT community who don't appreciate how they were depicted in this series. I've talked to a lot of people from the Hispanic community that don't like how they were depicted in this series. And I've talked to a lot of conservatives who don't like anything about this series. It seems all it really served to do was to piss off the two ends of the political spectrum. And that's not a good sign, to say the least. You shouldn't be feel bad for liking this series or even thinking that I'm wrong or making some weird point that I'm not, but I'm just saying I didn't like it, you know? I, I'm hedging my bets because in the last little bit of recording I did find some reviews in the positive that were kind of convincing. It's not the biggest piece of garbage in the world, but it definitely did disappoint. Maybe that's my biggest problem. This is a really cool character I don't feel this series lived up to, and that sucks. Oh well, better luck next time, and better luck next time to Marvel overall! But you know, they did have Black Bolt, they did have Silver Surfer, they did have their victories. But yeah, yeah, it was an interesting year to say the least in the world of comics. So this has gone on a lot longer than I intended, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and end things here. I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion on the various pros and cons in the comic book community under various aspects of it. I didn't really create a field for inkers or colorists because it's a really difficult field to parse out quality in terms of really bad inkers and colorists. I will give a shout out to uh, colorist Bonville. Her work was amazing this year in Doom Patrol. Uh, I also really enjoy, I believe it's uh, uh, Veidt's work on uh, Action Comics in terms of his lettering. That was great. But I don't have any contenders for the worst of in either category because, you know, color either speaks to you or doesn't. Uh, I can only really identify super strong examples of them. If you have your own people you think should have won one of these categories or movies you think I should have mentioned or that I should have made the best one in the year, by all means share them in the comments section below. But these were my favorites. So I hope you enjoyed this. You can expect more regular content coming out now that we've gone past the holidays. And yeah, thanks for your support, guys. I hope you all had a great 2017. You can help us out on Patreon. That would be appreciated. Otherwise, don't forget to like, subscribe, and keep reading comics.